Good day to you one and all. Welcome to Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast. This week, I'm going to get a little bit more serious than usual. In this episode, we are discussing the trope of the tormented artist. Does all the greatest music and songwriting come from pain and having a chaotic life? Or can you make great songs and be happy and content? I take on the role of the tormented artist and Jenny Mae Finn, my producer, takes on the role of the happy artist to see if we can represent both sides of this debate. Um, We filmed this remotely in a hotel in London. Unfortunately, the lighting is a little bit rubbish uh, and the camera wasn't very happy either, so I'm aptly sat in almost complete darkness with rivulets of pain and uh, uncomfortable uh, thoughts swirling around my brain. Um, And Jenny May is beautifully lit and uh, represents the contented artist. Um, I'm actually really pleased with the way this turned out. got quite deep and serious in parts. Um, there wasn't too much in the way of tangential meanderings, so it, it stays on topic pretty concisely all the way through. Um, so I hope you get a chance to listen to the whole thing and let me know what you think. Next time we film, just to reassure you, we will be brilliantly lit, both of us this time. Um, anyway, let me know what you think about the concept of the tormented artist in the comments. Um, I actually think it's quite an interesting topic and it's one that's been prevalent in the music trade and arts in general for well, since the beginning of time, probably. Um, for now, though, please, to enjoy. Again. Good day to you, one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Uh, the jaws of victory. Pitfalls of the music trade. And this episode uh, is going to be... It's called... What's it called? Why the are you tor- shivering? <laughs> the Tormented Artist. The Tormented versus Artist versus... The Happy One. The Happy One. Um, is it a battle or is it a dance? I feel like you've already answered the question by <laughs> saying it in that mystical way. Is it well lit or is it in the darkness? <laughs> okay, so th- you'll notice that there is a, a, a contrast uh, in the way that uh, uh, the, the two contributors of today's episode are lit. Um, I, will, I shall represent the tormented artist shivering in the shadows. Um, so dimly lit that really you can just see like the contour of, the a, of a nose. Ever. It's the worst. <laughs> Effort. This is so bad. <laughs> um, it's bad, isn't it? Yeah. But don't worry, because um, it's an, just listen to the audio. So onwards and sideways, just is a cappella because I forgot my guitar. Tin Hawkins rides again. Not sure what key that's in, or even if it's the right melody. What do you think? I'm not sure. People sing it at me. Did it sound half diminished with the way I did it? Just yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> again. Sus. Beautifully done. So, um, I suppose what we're discussing now is, can you, uh, is one of the things, can you write songs if you're happy? Is it? Well, the tormented <laughs> artist is like romanticised, aren't yeah. they? The warrior poet and all that. Yeah, you often talk about that. You think it, it's, you say you want pain and strife in your life. Because Enough you about my, uh, well, the, what you say you like the pain because it's, you're a songwriter and you need it to write songs. Well, I feel like if you have, you can't write a song from a place of contentment, can you? Like if you're just like, okay, job's not ideal, but really mustn't grumble. Must, mustn't grumble, I think is... But isn't that your outlook on how you behave in your life so you aren't sad all the time versus understanding the struggles? And then reacting to them in your day-to-day life in an appropriate way so it's not internal pain all the time. <coughs> okay, I'm going to put these back on because that was just a... <laughs> I didn't understand. You can't hear me without the headphones. That's it, now I'm used to hearing you with these on. So Go on, what were you saying? You it's, said it's something about, about um, songs or something. I said <laughs> that if you're content, that's just how you're reacting to it. So, you know, you've... Oh, you mean contentment is a, as a skill, as a... It's a skill set. It's not... You don't feel any of the ups and downs but mm. the way you're reacting to those situations in your actual life is from a place of equilibrium so you're not like sab- self-sabotaging and also self-sabotaging your own mental health and I mean that in just like a very yeah. literal way okay. as in like so you're not just sitting around annoyed and frustrated and but you've dealt you felt all those feelings when something bad is, like has gone wrong like monks apparently it's called the shadow side everyone has it mm. and then the way you behave is whether or not you would let that take Is that why you've positioned me in the shadow side here yeah. with no light on me at all? Yeah. I'm, I might actually be in your shadow at this point. The 
Look at my giant shadow behind me. Yeah, there's one on my face as well. It's coming, <laughs> coming from that lamp on the other side of you. I like being over here in the uh, in the dark. It's just it's a good way to live, actually, because you're just constantly wondering. You know, wondering how you sh- wondering if anybody can see my face at all. They can look at it. There it is. Mm, okay. It was like that for the whole last episode. No, no, I enjoyed uh, that is too. Is it annoying? You know, not in the slightest. You have your annoyed face on. <laughs> you don't know my annoyed, annoyed face. You've is- never seen my annoyed face. Have you? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we speak, you yeah. see it. <laughs> um, so, okay, so if, if for example, do you think that, a, like, let's, why don't we think of a song? Okay. Okay, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Mama yeah. just killed a man. Yeah. Put a gun against his head, mm-hmm. pulled my trigger, now he's dead. Mm-hmm. Life had just begun. Now I've gone and thrown, thrown it all away. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think that that's something that you could write if you have a spring in your stride and a whistle in your heart? Um, which actually, actually sounds yeah, like a I serious condition. So. Go on. Because the thing can happen. When, I'm, when you're processing it, how do you write about it? Can you not just you write about it after the thing has happened and you've processed it? You're not. No. No, that's not the idea. I think you write the stuff when it's raw, you feel it, you cry when you sing it, and then when you listen to it and you've performed it a hundred times, that's when it becomes a meaningless sort of diary entry that almost makes you cringe. But isn't that not so good then? Because you feel like you need to be in that tortured state rather than writing about something that's happened in a kind of like a dance after you've, comp- you know, you're dealing with all those emotions and, and no, realities. Because and all, <clears throat> like, so I always thought that that... It's quite a euphemistic expression that suffering for your art. I always thought that was like making sacrifices, you know, that you wouldn't have to make if, for example, you um, worked in a in a job that didn't involve as much creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, I think suffering for your art means like if you're going to try and break into the music trade and you don't come from a privileged background, you're sleeping on people's floors in one of the big cities of the world and trying to sort of position yourself geographically in an unfamiliar surroundings that you might just catch a wave somehow you know that's that's what i thought that meant i thought that was always talking about the initial part of your career really the bit when you're financially yeah unstable (laughs) but you've also said that you you said once that you create a chaotic life in order to write music yeah so what is that just an excuse for having a a chaotic life <clears throat> like why do the uh, well, why no the because I, I feel like it's like um, if you need to do like I've noticed that I can write songs um, when everything's okay I can do that yeah and in fact I think our big hit was probably I was actually alright at the time I was just pissing about mm. and I was and I don't think it's the all rightness of it all that comes across in that song. It's the fun of doing it. That's what I mean. So you were dancing with your art at that point. Right. Having probably experienced pain and love and all that. Yeah. But when it came to write, writing it, you came to it within a playful way rather than trying to eke. I see what you mean, yeah. The, out of the art. Okay, but the pain and the love and all that sort of stuff needed to happen at some point. But that will so happen. That, so that, I mean, technically, you are still talking about a tortured artist in inverted commas, aren't you? Because that's somebody who's processed everything and is now able to dance with it in a, yeah, in a joyous but, um, way, you know. But everything, but all of life is kind of like that, if you know what I mean. It's just about timing. Like anything that's happened, no one goes through life without anything having to overcome anything. But there's actually, I think t- the timing is important, though, in songwriting, because I think you can say things in a, in a song when you're still... You know, you're you're raw and you're hurt and you're trying to understand the thing that's happened in your life. If you write a song before you've had a chance to process it, then I think it's just the the outcome is completely different. There's actually things that you would maybe not allow yourself to say if you've got past all that and you've and you've managed yep. to process it and put all the the appropriate amount of um, emotion onto each of those events in your memory banks. I don't think there's a song there to be sung about the the stuff that actually hurts. 
I think it works in the other direction. Like if you're writing a song that's uplifting and stuff, it has to come from, it's the same, what's it called again? Um, Eric Peterson told me this one. He said, he said it's called a monomyth. Like every story in the world has the same narrative arc, right? It starts off with the protagonist leaving a place of comfort. It's the it, hero's journey. Yeah, the hero's journey, leaving the place of comfort um diving into something that's the opposite of comfortable emerging from it at the end changed in some way either for better or worse mm -hmm. but not the same crucially yeah that's every story in the world yeah so i think if you write a song while you're still submerged in i think you can still do it from a place of i think maybe it's I'm you can but you know part of the process of you know, uh, coping with those things that happen on an emotional or even just physical or whatever, whatever the thing is that you're writing about. If you write it when you're submerged, then it's realer. When you come out the other side, there's a lot of things that you just aren't prepared to address. Things that even with years of therapy, you'll be suppressing and burying deep in your psyche so that you never have to deal with it and you definitely aren't going to put it in a song once you've done it and you've put it boxed it off it's like thank god i got out of that i know i'll write a song about that exact moment when i wanted to i don't know i think i would do that fry my own face or something like that you know <laughs> because uh, you're clouded when you're i know that was a really specific example <laughs> <laughs> uh <clears throat> i don't think i'm talking about it as a state i think i'm talking about it as a trait States are temporary and traits is like a more permanent way of being. Yeah, well, the trait, how does the trait come about though? Is that, that's, that's another question about nature and nurture, isn't it? I mean, because like one of my traits is, as we discussed on, an, on another episode, one of my traits is that I don't seem to care. I don't seem to have the same curiosity about other people, but that wasn't always the case. Yeah. You know, I think when I was... 10 years old I was fascinated by other people really loved hearing stories about people I was transfixed by my parents regaling tales of folk that I had no idea what they looked like or who they were and I would always listen to the stories now I'm 48 couldn't give a fuck <laughs> I've heard those stories so many times I've heard them change don't care but that's a trait that I've that I now embody and then, so if you tell me a story about somebody I don't know, yeah, you, you, I have no curiosity. Yeah, you've taken that. Well, that's like a coping mechanism. I wouldn't say trauma. No, it's not though, is it? Because it's not trauma, it's just dealing with bullshit. Actually dealing but with bullshit. But apparently some people describe trauma as knocking you off the course you were on. You're like doing this and then something happens and you go that direction. And then you go that direction. But it's not though, because like trauma... I don't think traumatic is in I like saw somebody describe the, what the Beatles... You know, um, and the experience of being in the Beatles as trauma. You know, being that famous and yeah. everything you do being scrutinised, that's trauma. But at the same time, that's exactly what they wanted. I wouldn't say it was knocking them off the course. But not I think they them. willingly walked into a traumatic situation knowing that it was going to change them forever. Well, they mightn't have known it was going to change them forever. It could have knocked them into different... I don't think... If it had been non-traumatic, they might have been a different band. If it hadn't deeply affected them. They all changed in ways they probably never expected. Yeah. Like, really intensely. And, all, and, all, and then all kind of did go in different directions, didn't they? It was like, not, they were, I thought they were going this way, and then they went that way, and that way. You know that, did you watch the Get Back stuff? No, it was I don't have Disney. Oh. Uh. I watched, a f like, a little bit of it with you once. Because it's sort of, I was talking about it with uh, the guys, the guys from the band, band guys, and um, they were like, um, is it a coincidence that Ringo Starr comes across as just the coolest guy ever, Paul McCartney comes across as a, a godlike genius, um, John Lennon just seems to be a guy that pisses around all the time. And uh, George Harrison seems like a petulant child. And they were wondering if, like, had all four members survived, the, you know, just the last however many years, 
would that still be the case in the edit? Because it is an edit. Mm. I mean, it, it has to be. Yeah, I don't know. So they, it's an interesting have, question, though, isn't it? Because like the, the two surviving been, members are just, uh, they just come across as really cool and complete geniuses. I don't think Paul McCartney's reputation was very in flux. People thought he was really annoying. And yeah. I used to find him really irritating. I used to spend all my time defending him because he's always been my favourite yeah, Beatle. And I don't care if he was annoying. I don't care if like there's anything about him that sort of rubs people up the wrong way. He does rub his, people up the wrong way. But his music just speaks for itself, doesn't it? I mean, like, he's so, well, some people he's th- so amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, he can still sing. How old is he? 80. I mean, that's amazing. I know, I saw him last year at Glastonbury. He did talk for too long and he wouldn't leave. It was like three hours on stage. People were like, <laughs> get off at the point. And he kept playing on songs no one knew for, for the first half and then mm. got really into the songs that people wanted him to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so people were actually quite annoyed at him. I think he's still annoying people. <laughs> so, yeah. It's good if you can still annoy people at 80. Yeah. You know. And he called everyone Glastonburgers or something. Oh, my God. That's brilliant. I mean, I just love... I, I love it when people get annoyed at him. I think that's... I just... I probably love everything about him. You like but I do think, like But that. I do think that, like, if you... From an objective perspective, like, without... I mean, I just, I just love Paul McCartney nothing there's there's no way you could edit that whole get back thing in a way that would make me not love him mm. um but it is interesting that uh like i was looking at george harrison thinking ah oh, that's kind of disappointing the way he behaved in some some ways you know yeah but then i suppose that's the danger if there's a camera pointing at you and, and you do that there's always going to be a possibility that why do you, but, it, but it's Peter Jackson's vision, isn't it? Yeah, but maybe people just in those situations, different parts of them are coming out, you know. Yeah. Paul McCartney comes across quite playful in his writing, doesn't he? Like, I don't mean that there's no darkness. I, play, I, don't think, I yeah. think you can have, be really dark and playful, like dark humour. I think there's a there's a lot of variety in, yeah. you know, that the way he positions himself in that respect. Across his oeuvre. I guess it's sometimes a f- is it like seriousness versus light not lightness because that's not the opposite of seriousness I think playfulness maybe is the opposite of seriousness yeah C- some people take creative like I don't know I don't know if you know any artists like that they're like I'm writing you know I'm an artist don't talk you know don't upset my thing or I need to they, when they're writing something it really takes over them bring, and they get sucked in and brought down I don't know I think um like, does it have to be? When you talk about someone like Nick Cave, hmm. it is that, isn't it? I imag- I can imagine. Oh yeah, maybe he. Because he be. even describes the, the process yeah. like as being like um, an undertaking, like an emotional undertaking that's really quite challenging, and you know he's he's up for it, but it's not easy. It's, it's the whole yeah. his whole vibe, isn't it? Well, Elizabeth, I think I told you about Elizabeth Gilbert, the author. I think she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm completely wrong. But she was talking about it being a dance and she says a lot of male art creatives try to conquer like mm. a song. Mm. They're like, I'm doing this song and I'm, it's taking everything out of me and, but I'll you know, get there and I will overcome it and I'll make it happen. And she's mm. like, oh, I try and do it where I'm like, invite the creativity to, to come with me and dance with me and mm. we'll make something together. And it could be really sad and dark, but it's not like you're trying to like, I won. I've done it now. There it is. You know. But like does she think that's a male female thing? She thinks it's a masculine sort of vibe. Yeah. I think but, but like you said it earlier, really, you're like, oh, you can't, you don't, look, when you've done a song, you then box it off and then that's it. Hmm. I don't think, I think that's a different, that's a certain kind of mindset too. Actually, I, I, I've been reflecting on that. I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think I was right about that really because uh, I spent, I spent about, I don't know, I spent a few hours listening to everything that I've ever recorded. Why? You said you never like listening to anything. I know, I never do. Why did you? But I did it because I've never done that. And we're just, a, we're, we are currently embarking on the process of making another Darkness record. So I thought, I'll listen to all the other ones. And um, I didn't like any of it. I didn't like any of it at all. <laughs> you know? And the, the main reason being that like we did a lot of key chasing and I was always kind of like on the first record we found keys where I was screeching right at the top of my range in places 
beyond the top of my range in a couple of fluky places where I accidentally did a whistle tone on one of the songs but didn't have any control over it, it just went high. But that sort of thing would happen because I was kind of like really on the edge and some of the affectations that are in my singing voice in the higher mid is because I'm right close to the bit where it would naturally break between like my chest voice and my head voice. And I would need those affectations just to get the note over the line. If on a day when I'm a bit tired, it would be a bit flat. And sometimes I'd overshoot it and it'd be, and it'd be sharp, but it's exciting because of that. But it's not exciting to me to listen to it. It's just excruciating. And why? Do you not like the sound of your voice, isn't it? No, I like the sound of my voice when on a thing like, um, you know, Speed of a Night Time, which is probably the most popular track from the last record we did. Because I'm singing well in my comfort zone and I'm able to put other types of emotion into it without needing those affectations just to hit the note. Mm. Like I'm doing it for emotion or yeah. to find like a different way of presenting a melodic idea. You know, I'm actually opening a toolbox and finding stuff that, that's suitable that I never really have an opportunity to do when I'm right on the edge of being able to actually sing it, you know. Well, what sort of mood were you in when you were writing that song or singing it? Well, those songs, it's not really about the mood. It's like, because um, anything I did just sounded hysterical and manic, you know, and it's that's part of the excitement of listening to a Darkness record, an old one anyway. And um, and as I got better at singing, I've managed to find ways to to avoid that. But I don't want to chase keys anymore. I want to I want to be able to be a singer. You know, I want I want to have like uh, I want a song to be arranged so that the guitar sounds super powerful, and then just let me find my way to compete with that. You know, rather than chasing the keys so the guitars get weaker, you go up, and then I'm like soaring over the top of it and it just sounds like clown music sometimes if we, when we get it wrong and sometimes it sounds like I'm really tired because it's taken so much out of me to get get the performance out in the studio that even I don't like listening to it but is that because you the, you know how you felt like no it's because someone... I, 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 I've even forgotten the songs like because I'm as you said I've never done that before I, know, I never listen to anything but what I was going to say about um, the boxing off um, it isn't true that, that I do that because one of the things that I've noticed in a profound way was that n every single song that that is in the set or you know, that we've subsequently played live, I do it differently now. And it's, a it's because over the course of a, like a few like tens of shows or hundreds of shows after you've recorded the song, it bears no resemblance. Like the bounce is all different. The, the, the cadence of my singing is different. Like I'm finding different ways to syncopate the, the the actual notes themselves, you know, when I'm singing, it's partly because I'm playing guitar in some instances, but most of the time it's not because of that, it's just because the song's evolved. So it's never really boxed off. I've always just developed it, just, I mean, at least sonically. Yeah. You know, I'm saying the same words, I'm singing an approximation of the melody, but I think I've improved it over time. And that's why it's justifiable for us to do live albums, you know, because they don't sound like the originals, and they, but they don't sound worse. They're the same key, but it's just I'm doing it differently. Yeah. And that's because it's, you know, that's one of the, one of the symptoms of recording before you've fully developed a song. And it's, that's one of the reasons why I don't bother listening to the recording, because it's not going to help me find a way to do it live. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I so I, I actually take back what I said. <laughs> nothing nothing is boxed off. It's all What always... about the when you said are oh, you not gonna write about stuff after you've you know, after it's you've processed it? I think that's different as well. Like Easter is cancelled, like there's that song, um the the Heart Explodes one. That's really I'm still mm, toying with the idea of going for a very long swim and not coming back yeah. you know it's really and I wouldn't have done that if I'd have like I would never write that song now because I yeah, don't feel like that but anymore but you probably wouldn't have written it when there was at the very peak though either would you it I wasn't been, far away from the peak because that would that. have been really difficult when I'm really sad and I want to write something I can't I just can't do it it's too much it's like it's t I, there's too much on that page not because, not because I don't want to tell the story, but actually become... Cause I'm, I write a lot anyway. I've always written... There mightn't be songs because I don't have a guitar with me or something. But I would write. And then if it's too close to how I'm actually feeling in that moment, mm. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's just... It's so... It's 
I have to just I've tried I'm like this is when you should write it but if I leave it like a few weeks mm. I can really articulate that how I was feeling in yeah, hindsight okay. a lot better I'm like oh I was I can remember how I was feeling and then I can articulate it but in that time it's just like too much so have you ever tried to like because <coughs> you're sort of saying that you you journal right yeah well, and sometimes I journal in the form of like a song okay but I'm not planning on making a song what I was going to ask you was do, if you journal and it's not in the form of a song and then you sit down to write a song do you consult your journal to try and put yourself back in the mindset no, of when you wrote I those entries remember. You can't remember the... No, I, I can remember how I felt. Oh, you can? Yeah. I can remember it. If you, if I, I can remember it. I can remember I had this thing when I was writing some stuff for the memoir. And I sent some stuff to my literary agent. And he said, uh, yeah, it's a good story and everything, but how did you feel? <laughs> you know, so he, he needed me to add like uh, an emotional inflection to justify... Because you can't just go, yeah, and then I've done that, and then I had a fight with this bloke, uh, and then that bike fell over there, and then I won at Jenga. You know, none those things just are um, completely meaningless unless you explain how you feel as well. Yeah, you can make a game of Jenga the most interesting game if you talk about how you're feeling. Yeah, yeah. like the peril. Yeah. Um, but that, that's when you said compartmentalise. I think you meant emotionally compartmentalising maybe. When did I say compartmentalize? You said like compartment. You compartmentalize that song after you, you know, oh, the oh, feeling yeah. after mm. you, you know. Once you've processed it, I've compartmentalized it. It's gone over there, and I'm never going to think about it and unearth those feelings again. That's what you said. Yeah. So that might. Okay, be well, maybe I stand by that actually, because I don't think. Like uh, when I'm listening to the song, the reasons why I, I don't like the recordings or the studio recordings is nothing to do with the emotions that I felt when I was writing those words or the the songs, you know, it's more like, it's more like I just know, I know that having performed those songs subsequently, they've evolved and they've changed and they've improved. And I'm only talking about sonically, really. I'm not yeah. talking about, um, but you know, emotionally. Really. When it comes to the torture thing, because I don't know if I'm explaining how I think it is. If you're not tortured, you can go, oh, actually, I was, I was flawed there, or I did that wrong. Or you can talk, remember we were talking about certain humour reveals and certain humour yeah. conceals. If you're tortured in a certain way, you're not going to want to reveal your true self necessarily in a song. You're going to try and deflect from it or do, you know, write in a way that's but it's also not going like, to unearth um, everything. <laughs> uh, what, are you being all sleepy? No, no, I'm just, just trying to be, trying to consider things. Um, I don't know. Do you think you, do you think it's damaging if you have to feel like you're always in a place of pain in order to write? You're you're talking about that thing that I said about having like a chaotic life. Yeah, but I'm talk even just the trope of the, the tortured artist. Yeah, kind of that, yeah. Anyway, it's definitely a trope. Because I think it's more interest. I think it's skillful to be able to come through something and then write about it in the same visceral manner, without having to be like, oh, uh, you know. This is just, I'm sad all the time, or I'm just vague. Who, do you, who would you say was the ultimate tortured artist then? Morrissey's quite like that, isn't he? But he's played, he knows what he's doing, doesn't he? <laughs> Nick Cave, I guess. I don't know, I don't really know. I don't know. Do you think so what an amateur kind of, an amateur kind of perspective? I don't know, because, like... <sighs> I mean, nobody's forcing anybody to write a song. No. Nobody's saying, yeah, well, it's, you know, you might have some pressure to do things in a timely way, but the day you decide to quit, nobody's going to talk you out of it. And you're not, you're not under any sort of moral or legal obligation to write anything at all. You no. know, they might be a bit disappointed and, and, you know, make some legal maneuvers to try and get some of the money back if they've given you an advance. But ultimately, Everybody who does songwriting must be aware that they're lucky. <laughs> you know, they're lucky to have that opportunity to live their life that way. Well, not I guess not everyone. Because I'm sometimes just talking about people in general. I'm not talking about successful people. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Yeah, so like, yeah, but I mean... I'm such a tortured artist. Oh. Um, and actually, no, I think that is... <laughs> that's actually something... 
I go, I go back to that. The, the real torture is when you've made a commitment to it and nothing happens for years. That's actually where it comes from. The, the malcontent like, and actually the malnourishment, everything about that part of your career is simultaneously the most exciting and the most difficult, mm. you know? And that's the thing that makes people drop off, you know? Like you, you, can't, you can't live like that. You can't, you can't make songwriting front and center, the main, your main thing, the only thing that you do. You're gonna be starving. I mean, literally starving. <laughs> For a period of time, unless you've got rich parents, you know. So, it, and if you've got rich parents, and the other thing is, if you've got rich parents, are your songs going to be any good? Well, uh, it depends. You said everyone's stories in the world are exactly the same, yeah. no matter who they so, are. So, let's think about um, let's think about a songwriter that came from a place of privilege and wrote songs that are actually Kylie Minogue. Is she privileged? Is she, is she, is she a songwriter? Privilege? I don't know. <laughs> Stock Aitken and Waterman, wasn't it? <laughs> Good. I don't know. <laughs> Pretty I great can... example. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking like... <laughs> oh. I mean, <laughs> I, I love, I love Kylie Minogue as much as the next man. I do. I do. I do. However, I would argue that in the early part of her career... I don't think she was writing her own songs. I think it's stuff like Locomotion. Do the Locomotion. <laughs> come on, come on, do the Locomotion with me. Yeah. I mean, it's a song about a dance strategy. Well, that's fine and actual. <laughs> I mean, okay then, uh, just Black Lace. Pick, no, fine, tell another, <laughs> tell me another artist. I'm not telling you, tell me another Kylie song. <laughs> no, Black Lace isn't, a, isn't oh. Black Lace is another band but, that did oh. Superman and uh, Agadoo. Oh, nice. I, I was trying to keep it. Oh. Uh, who's a Nepo baby? A what? A Nepo baby. What's that? Nepotistic baby. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, who, you, tell me who came from a posh place. Julian Lennon. Who's that? John Lennon's son. An, yeah, but I'm talking about a successful person. No offense. Hey, <laughs> he had that song about salt water tears coming out of Miley his eyes. Miley Cyrus. I saw a clip of her recently going, "I am the most privileged person in the world. I grew up in a ranch. I had nothing to worry about, and I find it really hard to relate to normal people." That's what she said. It's mm. like when I sit with people and they're talking about all their problems, I'm like, I I've never faced any of their problems at all. Is that the same thing as the lack of curiosity in other people's lives? No, but I think she's just like I. No, she's like I have never experienced any of this, any of these issues. It's more of she probably is curious because she's like I don't know what you. I d- mm. actually don't like people, like oh I don't have any money to do this or I couldn't go on holiday or this has happened or you know we're ill and we can't afford healthcare. Or something. Mm. She's like, said it took her a while to really come to terms with the fact that she's very just like I'm not. I'm like my life is better than nearly everyone's in the world. <laughs> That's a pretty cool thing to come out and say, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, everyone, when people saw it, they were like, we appreciate that you <laughs> have just no, gone. ballsy to go and say but that. But she's, so she, she's good. Well, I don't mm. know if her songwriting's incredible. I don't know either. What's, what kind of songs has she written? Her latest one is about, well, she had that one about flowers. Didn't I send it to you? Okay. Well, everyone can, can relate to flowers. Yeah. They're everywhere, aren't they? It's about her ex. Who's a um, mo- movie actor. Well, yeah. <laughs> His favourite song was this song by Bruno Mars and she basically copied it word for word but made it hers. Um, word of advice to uh, ladies out there. If your partner's favourite song is by Bruno Mars, red flag, red, red flag. flag alert. I saw a clip of him dancing. He's okay at dancing. Word of advice to uh, female <laughs> listeners. If a gentleman appears to be okay at dancing, it doesn't necessarily mean... He's a good at songwriting. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably into Bruno Mars's music, which is nothing wrong with. Br- I like Bruno Mars. Should party as well. in the USA. I like Br- I like Bruno Mars as well, but I don't think I would ever say that one of his songs is my favourite song. No. I feel like there's like there would be probably thousands of songs that would come before a- any of the Bruno yeah. Mars oh, songs. Oh, he said that one. So, so wait a minute. Should, so her ex, her ex. Her ex. Her ex. Her ex. Not her FedEx. Ex. Her ex. 
Yeah, so I mean, I just find that staggering as a... Well, the song was like, I can buy you flowers. And the first line of her song is, I can buy myself flowers. And he's like, I and can bring this you is all because This is all because Bruno Mars made a song that, that her Yeah, and you know, ex that's cheated the on best. her. I don't know if it was a Taylor Swift, but you know. Anyway, the song is basically like... And she had Party in the USA. Then she had that Wrecking Ball song where she was naked on a wrecking ball in the music video. Remember that? I remember the song. Yeah. Was she naked in the video? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. And she comes in in a wrecking ball. She went to that phase of she was really naked that, for that tour. When you say you're coming in on a wrecking ball, it makes me think of Accept. Oh, yeah, and they just followed you on Instagram. Accept? Yeah, and they liked your last podcast reel about the abyss. How funny. That's lovely. Hey, ex- guys from Accept, um, it is I. Uh, nice to, thanks. You're playing a cruise with them. Really looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I always know what I'm supposed to be doing. So, uh, yeah, just going to say. Um, sounds all right, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I did meet some of them, actually, um, at a festival in... Germany. No, it you... was... It was somewhere else. You played that album on repeat for our three-hour drive one day. I love Accept. It was really funny. It's like, got to the end of it, but play it again. <laughs> I love Accept. How uh, can I... I know. I liked it too. Okay. <laughs> Miley yeah. Cyrus is my example. Um, I, I mean, I love Accept. Are they rich? I don't know. Uh, but what I think what I was going to say was, um, it's really cool if like, um, female listeners, if a gentleman says... Uh, to you that their favourite song is what was that one that I like something about balls yeah it definitely had something to do with uh, balls balls to the oh wall yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it balls balls to the wall man. if they say that their favourite song is balls to the wall by accept marry him immediately uh, I don't know if I can turn this message after a couple of months <laughs> fair good, yeah, that's a good a couple of months. <laughs> that's fair enough yeah. mm-hmm. mm. yes Balls to the was a bit in that. There's a bit in that song where he goes, uh, "Let's plug a bomb in everyone's eyes." I know. <laughs> I mean, that's what pulled me in actually. I think lyrically, that's just. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Well, I'm he's like, not. Doesn't sound too tortured. And I needed to hear. I needed to hear more. Yeah, and we did. You say that though, because I mean, I think he's like he was like a, a lead singer in the Bon Scott mold, really, mm. in terms of the way he projected his voice and everything. But um, Bon Scott, would you describe him as a tortured artist? I don't know. I don't know anything actually about him. No, so. but I mean, for, okay, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about him after you've answered that question. You think, do you, would, if you had to guess? I think he had issues, probably. Yeah, you think? Alcoholism. I reckon there might have been a bit of that going on. Yeah. And I think there was some, there was probably some experimentation in slightly more... Sexual ways. Why are you saying that? I was going to say the harder <laughs> drugs. <laughs> you like, sexual ways. The jeans. <laughs> what? The jeans. The jeans. <laughs> experimenting with his denim well, choices. <laughs> they were tight in all the right ways. They were. One of the wrong ways as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what killed him in the end. His <laughs> jeans. No, of course it wasn't. <laughs> um... Yeah, but I, w- I would say that like his lyrics, uh, like he's he was one of the people that he might have been the main contributor to the the rock lyric blueprint of yeah. bawdy kind of but maybe you're lewd right. stuff. Maybe I have you ever met anyone who's just all right all the time? What do you mean? Like they don't have to have any issues. Is maybe that- you're not like me because I tend to ask people like, oh, "Are you depressed?" And stuff. Yeah, I mean... Uh, like, they're just like, what, their life, they're like, you know, there's issues in life, but like, things go wrong, but they're not... I do know some people like that, actually. How do you find interesting? They're always surfers. Oh they are. They surfers always are. don't... Who, how do you know so many surfers? I know, I know a lot of people who do surfing. I do. <laughs> One of them, actually, was um, a really good friend of Ed's. He um, used to be one of our guitar techs. He... Drank himself, daft every night. Really, doesn't sound I, like he's okay. I feel like he was struggling, 
moved to Bali, yeah. surfs every day, totally serene all the time. Why is that? Weed? No, he doesn't smoke. Hundred percent sure. Maybe he went through. A no, it's because he's surfing. I mean, he's I did. Go, I did try surfing last year. You can't you actually it? think about anything else. Exactly. Actually, there was the most serene time. I mean, it was in the North Sea, so it was also I felt like I was beaten up. It wasn't like. Is that when you went surfing with my dad? No, he wanted to join. Then after his, we went bodyboarding. Mm-hmm. It was. Were you? <laughs> I'm definitely not going to ask that question. Um, <coughs> but the surfing it was two hours, mm. and you go out and you're like, okay, I'm going to get a wave. Then you just get drowned by a wave, and yeah, like yeah. a washing machine. And in yeah, that yeah. moment, you can't think about anything else. You're just yeah, like, yeah. I'm drowning. Yeah. And then afterwards, you're like, ah. no, I've, that I've, was two I've, hours of I've peace. I've done it a couple of times. I just loved it. I thought it was awesome, and and totally in the moment, it's yeah, that thing. Can't think about anything. And else. I feel like um, I saw this program about people who are happy. And they found this guy who was in his 60s and he just surfs every day. And they, they declared him the happiest person that they could find in their you know, endeavour as a, as a documentary team. And I could totally understand that. I yeah. think if I wanted to be happy, I'd just go and surf every day. And I'm not pretending that I'm good at it or anything. No, like, it's I'm better just... if you're bad at it because you get drowned and you can't think about anything mm. else. It's like being in a washing machine. But like you get like, it's not even about like the achievement. When you stand up and you can actually do it for a little bit, it's actually not about that. It really is just the fact that you're totally immersed in what's happening in the here and now. Yeah. And it's just wonderful. It's the best experience. So yeah, to answer your question, yeah, well, I do like, know some well, people Let's like say that. non-surfers, like, nor- like people right, haven't like, people escaped who everyday life. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a cop-out as well, isn't it? <laughs> you know, people, people can't handle friends, life like, just oh, going to do that. Do you like. have, you know, do you get sad and stuff? Because like, I thought everyone was just sad. And like, in, not all the time, but like this. Mm. <laughs> They're like, no. And like, do you, do you ever feel anything? They're like, and not really any massive fluctuations. And they're just like, all people right. People on Prozac. No, there's some people who don't have that deep sadness. and pain. So maybe that's why I'm like. They're not people. <laughs> it, that's what I thought as well. Yeah. I don't trust anyone who's not like yeah. slightly. But then there are people, I think a lot of people are like that. They're not like, I thought everyone was like that. Because I just thought, uh, how are you human if you. I don't know, but I think we more have a more of a propensity for feeling harder emotions more often. I'm not we, as in you and me. Yeah, and that's maybe why I'm like, oh, you don't need to be in pain all the time because it's tiring, and I don't weird, want I don't I want the tormented <sighs> thing to be something that you need. But maybe they are. I think it's very difficult to not be tormented. I actually think that's the reality because as soon as you start thinking about anything you're going to find something in there that pisses you off and when I say pisses you off makes you unbelievably sad anything yeah we've always, I guess because like, everything's got a shadow isn't it like everything that's doesn't matter what it is it's always something but some people seem to be able to surf above it <laughs> surf. stop talking about surfing. <laughs> but you know there's maybe they just not aren't tapped into that I don't mean that in an like elitist way mm. I mean that and they're, they're don't, not down there emotionally it's not a bad thing it's not a bad thing what, what isn't a bad thing feeling things it's annoying it's fucking annoying but that's why I'm like if you that's maybe why I'm defending it's really unsettling feeling stuff but that's what I mean. I'm trying to, I'm talking about, maybe that's the mindset flip I'm trying to talk about where it's like, it doesn't have to be unsettling. You can, you can like transform it into something that's like joyous and fun to dance with. Like mm. it's not, you feel those feelings and you're like, okay, how will I work with this? You know, despite it being maybe painful or hard rather than being tormented by. I was just waiting for an opportunity to say enough about my sex life. Oh. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Sorry. But you know what I mean? Maybe I'm trying to flip it. I'm just really waiting. <laughs> because I, we both feel the torment. So I'm like, uh, we need to have another way of also doing this. Cause otherwise, it's going to like kill us. Being tormented all the time. Or just like be horrible to live through life if you're constantly battling. With yeah, I think whenever I feel anything, I need to smoke. Yeah, me too. To cope. Not that I smoke. Or... <laughs> <laughs> 
don't, I, I don't know. Usually it's like for, uh, if I'm sad or something like that and I smoke way more, I can feel myself just slowly killing myself. Like it's a really protracted self. Yeah, you are killing yourself every time you're doing it. Yeah, and I, and I know that. I also know I shouldn't be doing it, but it's just like when I get sad, it's like that's what I do. It's really... Um, what's annoying about it is that one day I won't feel sad and I'll be like... <sighs> <laughs> and I'd su- suddenly get ill and that'd yeah. be game over won't it it is really annoying having to feel stuff is annoying that's why I think I'm because I sound like I'm saying no pain doesn't create good art but I think I'm like I understand that it kills people as well in a way yeah but I think, is there so any I think way of like, channeling it in a way that isn't torment like there's there's a torment here's the da- choreography to make it like not kill you like I think if I had one wish, if I had one wish and I could go back and I could do all this again, I would just, when I turned 18, move to Bali and go surfing every day for the rest of my life. I really wish that. Because it would be serenity. You know, it would be... Is that, what's that mindful thing you sometimes talk about? Is mindful? That mind, cause you're, mindful thinking? Or just like an activity where all of your emotional and physical resources are dedicated to that thing that's happening right there and then. Yeah. That's the whole thing. That's life. But that's I imagine those way, people isn't? also play music and sing and dance. Yeah, but they're fucking tedious and... But they probably don't care because it's not, they're not trying to prove anything. I think if I did it, because the way I do anything, I would be so exhausted. I'd be like, guys, I know, I know it's nice on the beach and that, but can you put the guitar away it's just I've had enough of that I would, ha- I would have no interest in music maybe but if you're I just serene, want to hear the ocean I don't want to hear you fucking but you wouldn't have that annoyed ang- angry you wouldn't care I think I would I would preserve that I think I would preserve no that. but that's where all I would your... save it for those tedious cunts that just See? sit there playing <laughs> <laughs> sit there playing the shitty acoustic you'd be fine songs. you'd be like oh they're in their flow state that's cool yeah I'd be like but Guys, I love the flow state, but can you keep it down? I'm about to shove that acoustic guitar up your f***ing ass. Let's go surfing. But you've been that guy with the acoustic guitar. Of course I haven't. What do you mean? When? If you see a guitar, you're probably always singing and dancing with it. I do like to have a little dance and sing yeah, around with the guitar. I think you'd I? like it. Yeah. I think you'd just be singing, dancing, lying in the hammocks. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But all I know is... That's how I would have liked to have lived a life, you know. But would you have wanted that at 18? Uh, no, I was chasing music. Yeah. Mm. But were you tormented at 18 or did you, were you tormented after 18? I'm tormented at eight months, probably. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> My teeth are coming through. <laughs> this hurts. <laughs> it's all pain, isn't it? Sometimes, yeah, but that's what I'm trying to figure out. Mm. Because you, there must be a way of... I know I keep saying dancing, isn't it? but that's because... You like that expression, don't that's you? That's because I'm like... It's bringing joy through the pain or whatever. It sounds, it sounds so crap and bullshit. It makes me sick. But... I get the torment, but you can't... If you dwell on it, it will eat you away, like eat you alive. Like you'll just it'll eat away at you, unless you transform it into something that's man like, like surfing. Well, that's I think that's the thing about music that I always talk about is the the fun the fun of being on stage. Yeah. To me, that's like catching a wave, man. Uh, sorry. Yeah, but there must be some. <laughs> yep. But like the tour, tor- yeah. It's also because I don't want you to be tormented and it hurts me. Hurts you? Yeah. How do you think I feel? <laughs> yeah, I know, I understand the torment. I spend a lot of time alone though, so I have to like really, I don't have any distractions, so yeah. I do have a lot of processing. I'm alone a lot, with no distractions. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even, I don't think I'm a, a particularly, I don't think it's, you know, every, I, think, I do think that everybody suffers. But I think, so. All the time, you know. I think everybody suffers to a degree every day. Everybody, in some way or another. That's what I thought, but some people... It's... No, there isn't anybody like that. There really isn't. 
I don't know. I spoke to some people and they're definitely more level. Level? Yeah. That's not living. You see, you're reveling in the torment. I know, I can't help myself. I fetishize it. Yeah. I think it's just like, oh. There's something really exciting about being fucked up. Yeah, but that's the fetishization of the tormented artist. But I can't help it. I can't help it. I know it's not healthy. I just can't and help it. it. It is a mindset shift. Because you're like, oh, they're so boring. They're sitting around playing shitty music by a campfire. But they're having the time of their lives. And you're sat around tormented. Not in that moment, though. When they're playing their guitars around the camp, they're just being tedious. So let's face that. No, they're, not. they're just having a nice time. They might actually I'm be sorry, nice time. But that's I'm not... the same. I look no, at people... No, that nice time is when they're on the, on the surfboard. No, the they're enjoying is... that as well. I've seen people enjoy themselves. God, there's nothing more tedious than campfire guitar stuff I hate that I know we're like that because we're moody little buzz kills in the inside <laughs> other people actually enjoy life sometimes <laughs> well they're wrong <laughs> that's not living enjoying life isn't living okay in conclusion you don't have to be a tortured artist to create stuff that's meaningful to your audience Mm. Or you know, just people in or people who consume music in general. But it helps, right? Didn't I think John Lennon said all music comes from the darkness? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Didn't he say that? I don't know. He said something like that. It might have been Elton John. I might have misremembered that because I think it's. I always think of Elton John Lennon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Um, but let's not start. We got, well, we, at the very end, we talked the fetishization of the torture yeah. that popped out. Yeah, and I just can't stop myself from doing it because there is, I mean, I think that um, without that torture, I mean, how does an artist like Ren get formed? You know, he's a diamond created under extreme pressure. Yeah, but he seems to be trying to, like, not be, he wants to be, not feel those feelings. I feel like you might be trapping yourself in them. No, but it's an ex expression of something. And I think once you've done that and you record it, it doesn't carry the same emotional weight for the person that's created it. But it helps other people who are experiencing anything that you can say is similar. But I, do you feel like you're doing that for people? No, but I do think that's a byproduct of it, a positive byproduct of expressing something super traumatic or, where, you know, that's. Yeah, he's, well, he's like a very case for that yeah but in the, in the of should... the current crop i'd say he was yeah. <laughs> the, the, the strongest argument for it really. but i don't think you need to constantly be tortured torturing yourself in order to create great music i don't think you do no i think you deserve to feel good as well and you would create great art from it too i think you'd make amazing stuff if you felt good we'll never know <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, this has been a great episode where we've dissected the nature of, well, all of it really. I mean, art itself. I mean, I don't think this just applies to music even, does it? No. Think about that fellow that cut his own ear off. What about him? Yeah. <laughs> art. Um, and uh, yeah, so nice one, guys. See you later. <laughs> Should I sing the song or is it, do we do that? Or how do we do it? Uh, you do, yeah. Do I do the whole thing? Yeah, you do, yeah. Don't forget to like, subscribe. You didn't know to do the theme tune. Uh, you can... Uh, still keep my eyes You're so moody yeah. today. I am moody. I tortured. It's because you, you tortured yourself just before this episode. I love to torture myself. I did, actually, didn't I? <sighs> Justin Hawkins rides again. Again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, watch one of these two videos, and uh, listen out for more long form uh, podcasts. <laughs> we'll discuss more pitfalls of the music trade. Um, do you want to say goodbye? Goodbye. Adieu. Thank you so much for watching. Um, what do you think after seeing all that stuff? Do you, do you need to be a tormented artist to make great music, or can you allow yourself to be happy and still create great art? Use the comment section to discuss this. Um, and in the meantime, I'll see you next Monday for yet more long-form magic. Cheers, guys. Adieu. Okay.